Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the first ever, best ever debate on, we're, we're streaming live from, from Facebook live right now. Um, I'll be your, your host this time, Theo Hicks. Uh, Joe's gonna sit this one out. And my opponent, my opponent is going to be Sue Oyuela of b and Freedom Formula. Sue, thank you for being on. How are you doing today? <laughs> Great, Theo. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here, to be the first one to do a debate with you. Fantastic. And I wasn't doing opponents because I was going to have a, an easy victory. I was saying opponent because my, my outcome of this debate or this uh, conversation is to not have a, a fist of cuff fight back and forth on what's the better a strategy. Uh, my outcome is to help everyone listening uh, learn the different strengths and, and challenges of the these two different investment strategies that you guys can determine determine which one uh, fits best for for your current situation because at the end of the day as real estate investors we know that uh, there really isn't the the best strategy um, the best strategy kind of depend is subjective and is based off of your experience your time commitment um, the amount of money you have um, where you live and uh, and things like that so. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go through um, a list of five different factors and kind of uh, go back and forth and explain um, how those factors relate to each of our, our strategies. But before we get into that, it's important to have some, some context. So uh, Sue, do you mind giving a, a quick background on how you uh, got into short-term rentals as well as what short-term rentals um, actually are? Sure. Um... Let's see, uh, back in 2011, I was deep in debt looking for a way to make extra money and somebody said the word Airbnb. And in 2011, most of, mostly people would respond, Airbnb what? <laughs> so uh, it was a way to make extra money by renting a room or a house to short-term guests, um, kind of like a hotel in a way. And this mm -hmm. was a website that allowed you to create a listing and Airbnb markets that to the world, so now travelers have another option for where to stay, and they can come across your listing and say, sure, I'd love to stay with you. So back at that time, we had nothing to lose. We were just trying to find a way to make an extra $100 to you know, put towards our debt and get out of debt faster, and within the first month, we made an extra $1,000. And that was just by renting a shed in our backyard. <laughs> so we were like, wow, what else will people rent? And that's where I'm an entrepreneur and, you know, ideas and woo. And so I started getting very creative with space. And I rented the laundry room in my house, the cupboard under the stairs. We turned into the Harry Potter room, um, rented my oh, couch, wow. rented actual rooms. Um, and after nine months, I'd created enough uh, income from this little side hustle to quit my full-time job. And then at that point, I started saying, what else can I do with this amazing tool called Airbnb? So I started renting other people's property and um, timeshares and just, I used four different business models mm -hmm. that eventually allowed uh, my husband to quit his job too. Uh, we got completely out of debt and we were making a six-figure income and just started saying, this is the best thing since sliced bread. This is the actual door to financial freedom. We have to tell everybody about this. So um, I have started teaching and coaching. I've created an online course to help people eliminate the learning curve that I had to go mm -hmm. through <laughs> to create a six-figure income with these short-term rentals. And they're a wonderful alternative to long-term rentals. So I'm excited to be able to share the ins and outs and the pros and cons with you here today and hope that your audience will benefit from that. Well, I'm sold. I'm, uh, I'm converting all my, my long-term rentals to short-term rentals tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if, but I'm, I'm really excited to learn about yeah, your four, we were talking about beforehand, your four uh, short-term rental strategies, because I think even if you aren't going to do short-term rentals, I think uh, learning about these strategies can help you um, uh, make, a, uh, make your long-term rental business uh, more um, uh, effective or to kind of do it in addition to your, your long-term rentals. Mm -hmm. And so just, just really quickly, um, He's like in one sentence define uh, what short-term rental is in just for the, the purposes of the conversation. Okay. <laughs> a short-term rental is anything less than 30 days. Uh, so if you're going to rent out a room, a space, or a house uh, on Airbnb, it's going to be less than a 30-day rental to 
someone who's traveling for any number of reasons, but it's actually a simple distinction, but a very powerful one. Okay. And we'll get more into that in a moment. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, just uh, really quickly, uh, most of you guys know my background, but I bought my first um, long-term rental in, oh man, I think it was 2013. I house hacked a duplex um, that I bought after uh, just learning about real estate the night before. I had a property under contract within, within two days, so uh -huh. I, I got after it. So that kind of speaks to, I guess you don't really need a lot of experience, or maybe you, maybe you do based off of how, how it turned out and some of the problems that I went through. Uh, but after I, I bought that, I held it for a year, I uh, sold it, and then um, a couple of years later, uh, which was actually in uh, the past August, I bought um, 12 units, so three different fourplexes uh, at the exact same time uh, while having a full-time job. And I, I managed those myself for uh, three or four months. And then I uh, moved to Tampa for my wife's job and ended up putting those under uh, property management. So I, I have an understanding of the house hacking strategy, the um, actually buying rentals and then landlording or managing them yourself, as well as um, my favorite, which is having someone else manage them for you. Uh, so that is, is my background. And for the purposes of this, of this conversation, I'm going to um, define short uh, long-term rentals as um, at, so it's, it's an active strategy. So uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the, the, um, the property manager, but it's not like a passive investment where all you do is just um, you know, give money to someone else and they do the, all the, the, the um, you know, finding and analyzing and managing of, of deals for you. Uh, so it's active in a sense that you have to buy it um, yourself and find the deal yourself. Um, I'm also defining it as you using um, me using my own money. I'm not raising capital for it because that's not not going to be a, a fair talk about that because it's completely different. And then um, I'm also just going to um, keep it to um, residential properties just because I, I want to do it. I want to talk about more of someone who has a little experience or is just um, starting or is looking to transition. So they're not going to be you know buying a 20 unit as their, as their first long-term rental deal. And then to distinguish it from short-term rentals, I'm talking about a 12 month um, non-furnished um, units. Um, so the, the, the first, I guess, a factor, and I guess the most important factor, and the one that I already uh, know that short-term rentals uh, wins on is the returns. Um, so for, for my uh, long-term rentals, when I'm looking at uh, deals, I want a, um, a, a five-year, uh, average of 10 to 15 uh, percent cash on cash return. Um, I'm usually buying 25 percent down, and so I want a, a 10 to 15 percent cash on cash return over a a, a five year period. Um, what are the returns? And I'm, I'm sure this is a very vague question, but what are the the range of returns for short term rentals? Well, that's one of the things that I discovered early on that just blew my mind. So. Um, Short answer is double to triple what you're used to making with long-term rentals. But the way I discovered that was when we started renting a room in our house, I was looking at like, what if I went, went to rent it on Craigslist? And it was maybe $500 a month to rent a room in someone's house. Mm -hmm. And if you break it down, that's $17 a day. And so when we put it up on Airbnb, it was $50 a night. And that's, going to be times 30 nights in a month, that's $1,500 a month, triple what you would have gotten from a regular long-term yeah. tenant. And when we applied the same strategy to a whole house rental, the same thing happened. We were renting it for $1,200 a month. And when we put it up on Airbnb, we made $3,600 a month. So that's super powerful. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it across the board. And the funny thing is, is when I talk to landlords, and I say, how much rent are you getting from your long-term tenants? And they're saying, well, you know, I could probably get any more, but I'm afraid to raise my rent because, yeah. you know, it's so hard to find a good tenant. And if I raise it, they might leave, and then I don't know what I'm going to get. So they wind up kind of shooting themselves in the foot almost by not raising the rents as much as they should to keep that income coming in the way it was, you know, that was the original intention, right? Invest in real estate and get that passive income coming from the rentals, but you have to continue to increase it. But a lot of landlords don't. So, you know, if they could switch to the short term model, they're actually going to get a bigger boost in their rental income right off the bat. So I call the difference between renting by the, the day, you know, by the month to mm -hmm. the long term tenants 
compared to renting by the night to the short-term guests, the difference is night and day. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, Sorry, a little corn there. That's, that's something that I, I, I uh, saw discovered in, in my research um, about returns is the uh, is consistency. Uh, people were saying how you know oh for short-term rentals the um, since you're doing it you know daily or or, or weekly or monthly um, the the returns are not going to be consistent month over month. Whereas for for long-term rentals. Of course, there's exceptions to this rule, but uh, usually you're going to be you're going to be collecting the same amount of rent um, each month. And so, uh, can you just kind of speak on you know do the the um, you know, month month over month rents fluctuate a ton? Is there some months where you'll make no money, and the other months you'll make you know, six times as much as you usually do, or is it you know consistently that three times number month over month? Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, I. I it speaks to risk tolerance because the income does fluctuate and it really depends on a lot of factors, you know, where your property is, you know, if it's going to have year round traffic or if it's just going to be seasonal. So it's going to vary depending on where the property is and what your, who your niche is. But, um, there's actually a really cool website that you could check out. I could just throw it out there for folks. Oh, absolutely. It's air DNA dot, co not dot com dot co and it's got something called the rentalizer mm -hmm. and it's really cool you put in your address and it will show you exactly what type of occupancy rate to expect based on you know every month based on you know seasonal demand and all that good stuff so yeah that's a very difficult question to answer but i found that for me we're in los angeles and the you know, it fluctuates. Summer's our busy time. Uh, we have, you know, huge events sometimes where our, our income just skyrockets, but um, it's always outperforming the long term. And for me, high turnover is a good thing because I actually have five income maximization strategies that I incorporate into my short term rentals so that every time we have a turnover, I'm actually adding to my bottom line. I'm, in, I'm adding uh, additional streams of income to my income with that. So it could be very powerful, but you have to have the tolerance for that, you know, so it's yeah. not for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a couple of things you hit on, we'll, I'll definitely ask you more questions on when we move uh, to the, um, the other factors. But the, the last question I have, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but I know a, a one thing that, a lot, that attracts a lot of people to long-term rentals is the ability to accumulate equity, whether it be just natural appreciation or uh, renovating the unit, renovating it and uh, increasing the rents and uh, increasing the property values that way. And then after you know, a year or two, pulling out um, equity and then using that to you know, kind of rinse and repeat and, and buy some more properties. Uh, is that a, a strategy that you can use in short-term rentals? Absolutely. Um, I've, I've known quite a few people that you know, they, they want to do the buy and hold for a couple of years because their, their end strategy is to actually, you know, flip it and get that equity out. But why not just rent it on a short-term basis in the meantime? Because that actually gives you a lot more flexibility when it comes to exiting that property. You know, if you're on an annual lease, mm -hmm. you've got to wait 12 months for it to expire. But with Airbnb, you can stop that calendar at any time you want. So you don't miss out on opportunities like that. Oh yeah, I, I, I figured. A, a quick follow-up question: Is there, uh, when, when the bank is, is looking at the property and, and looking to to do, you know, whether it's a refinance or um, a home equity and a credit, uh, does, and do you show them, you know, how what, what your occupancy and what your what your rents have been for the past, you know, twelve? I guess is the process the exact same as it would be for for a rental, or are they like, oh, well, this is, you know, since it's, you know, maybe inconsistent, they they look at it at differently and have a lower LTV or, or, um, or it's a higher LTV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really cool because I was doing Airbnb since, you know, 2011 and, um, I wanted to refinance and see if a bank would accept that income. And they were like, no, that's ridiculous. You know, but now that they've been here, it's, it's 10 years now that Airbnb has been around and they are viable now. Right. And they've proven their business model. So now, yes, banks are accepting your Airbnb uh -huh. income as proof that you've got steady income that you can you know, confidently refinance or, or yeah, just refinance on right now. So yeah, so that, that, that's a huge um, pro, yeah. or I guess recent development for, for short-term rentals. Yeah, uh, very exciting. So, so that, return, that, that completes the return factor. The next one that I wanted to kind of uh, talk about is, I, I called it barrier to, to entry. So that means, uh, I have it broken into subcategories. It means a lot of different things. 
Um, the, the, the first one is about the uh, location. And we actually had a, a someone who's watching um, ask a question, uh, Whitney, and uh, he asked, Hi. can you Airbnb anywhere or are there cities that, that will not allow it? If so, what do you do then for short-term rentals? Uh, I, I'm assuming he means um, maybe the city has a regular, uh, the location has a regulation against um, Airbnb. Um, so uh, do you want to kind of speak on that? Absolutely. I mean, yes, you have to comply with the local laws and rules. And if they require a permit or whatever it is, you need to find out what that is and comply. So um, it's, it's difficult, though. There's no blanket, no standard any, you know, anywhere. So you do have to do your due diligence and do some research online. Um, you know, if I start with the, the city and the municipal code to start seeing if they have anything in place for short-term rentals. Um, they use a lot of different keywords. If you're going to do the research in your city, you can look under short-term rental, vacation rental, sublet, um, some really archaic terms they're using are like uh, room and board, you know, boarding house, rooming house, things like that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, they have all kinds of different terminology. So it's a little tricky to find out what the rules and laws are. But uh, Airbnb does have a help section for that as well. So for the bigger cities, you can already find the documentation in Airbnb's help section, and they link to all the, all the things you need. So it's really helpful. But um, I mean, yeah, let's say, for example, you're in a city or, um, well, oh, goodness, so many things just came to mind. <laughs> so <laughs> the, um, I have what I call like <laughs> the pyramid of safety of where I consider doing Airbnb. And you know, the, the top of the pyramid is the, the don't do it area. And that's usually in um, HOAs, gated communities, condos with, you know, CCNRs, because they have their own little governing boards that in any moment they can change the rules. And yeah. if you do Airbnb and they decide to say it's not permitted, then poof, you're out of business. So the risk is too high. Um, and I've seen that happen to a lot of folks. So I don't do it in um, anything that's got regulations like that. Um, apartment buildings are the next uh, most dangerous place to do Airbnb in the sense of getting shut down. Uh, they're saying that it's uh, eliminating affordable housing. So, mm, yeah. you know, do that with caution. But if you get out into the suburbs, <laughs> away from the hub, away from the main spot. That's what's powerful about Airbnb too, because you make more money out in the suburbs because first of all, it costs you less to own a property or rent something out in, you know, away from the city center and you still make fantastic returns on Airbnb. So that to me is the sweet spot, staying away from the main place that's got all the attention on it, you know? So, um, you know, there are some cities that have been completely, it's just not allowed. Um, I was speaking in Michigan in Grand Rapids and the people were like, no, they don't allow it here in Grand Rapids. Hmm. Yeah. But the border, like one block away is the next city over. They have no rules or regulations whatsoever. Do whatever you want. So if you've got that flexibility, that's what I usually say is just look across the border from the next city over yeah. and everything could be just fine. Um, but if you don't have that flexibility, um, you probably shouldn't do it on that particular property. But there are ways to still get in on the Airbnb game Perfect. if you still want to play. I'll tell you more about that later. <laughs> Perfect. I, oh, yeah, so you, you basically hit on what I was going to ask you next. But, so I'm, I'll, I'll explain that. And then if you have anything else you want to further elaborate on. But um, obviously, there's, there's the, there's the um, you know, regulations of the location. But there's also the, the demand of the location. And I know for, you know, for, for long-term rentals, you can do a rental in the city, you can do it in the suburbs, you can do it in, you know, I guess you could definitely run out a farmhouse and do it that way. Um, yep. What, and again, you kind of already hit on this and it was actually surprising because I figured that it would be ideal in like a big, I mean, I guess in the, 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 the big cities, but you're saying that the suburbs are actually, um, actually better. The, the one person that I knew personally that did um, Airbnb, uh, they actually had theirs next to a hospital and they had, um, so, so what they were actually going to do or what they considered doing was, um, so obviously the hospitals have their hospital beds. They were going to turn their, their house into like a, a makeshift hospital room. So people, so they could you know put excess patients in there. And they were telling, I can't remember exactly what they said, but the amount of money that they would have made by doing that was like something in, in, insane. It was, it was crazy because 
you know, there's like obviously regulations of how many how many beds you can put per room um, and, and things like that. But uh, they were by, by a hospital. So um, can, you, can you walk us through um, what are the types of things that you want to look for um, in, the, in, the, in the, the specific market that, you know, will let you know that there's going to be a strong demand for these short-term rentals? Oh, wow. Okay. I'm sure there's a million things. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's one of the things that's in my course because that's a real exercise to try and identify who your ideal guest is. But what I've learned is no matter where your property is, there is a niche to serve that's, you know, somebody's going to want to stay there on a short term basis. Um, okay. Yeah. And you always discover things kind of like a surprise. Like we um, started getting a lot of poker players coming to our house professional poker players. I'm like, nah, you can't make money at pro you know, professional. That's an oxymoron. Come on. No, really. They actually are professional. And we didn't realize that we're three miles away from the commerce casino, which is the poker capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And we're like, who knew? So three miles away, poker players love us. They can, you know, get there for five, less than $5 in an Uber and it's perfect for them. So as I've traveled, this is what I found. No matter where you go, there is a niche. And um, my brother-in-law, he actually, he comes to me, he goes, guess what, Sue? Uh, he does Airbnb on his own house in his rooms. You know, we've kind of shared it with our whole family. And now they're all in Airbnb. And he says, um, I bought a property out in San Bernardino. I said, that's great. What did you buy? Uh, two acres. I go, yeah, well, what, what kind of house is on it? And he's like, just dirt, just two acres. And I said, great. And he's like, yeah, it's already up on Airbnb. I'm already making money. I'm like, wait. Okay, this is two acres of dirt in Lucerne Valley where you don't have water, electricity. There's a road about a mile away. You get cell signal, and that's it. And he's got a niche out there because people love to go ride their ATVs. He's got people that are doing, you know, film crews that are renting it. I mean, all kinds of people want to rent that property, and he's making a killing on a piece of dirt. He didn't even have to develop it. I was like, dude. <laughs> yeah, so, so it sounds like it's just you, uh, it, it just depends on how, how creative you, you want to get. And if you're a super creative person, like, you know, like someone like you, definitely, I mean, you started off renting out a shed in your backyard, <laughs> then uh, this is, it sounds like an amazing strategy. For someone like me, who's like uh, a spreadsheet guy, I'm very good with numbers, but whenever – yeah, I'm, I'm told, to, you know, my wife asked me to pick out a, a certain color couch. I'm just like, I don't know. They look the exact same to me. Um, so I, I think uh, for, for me, I really like um, long-term rentals just because it is so, so, so simple and, and, and basic. And um, again, I know some people get, get a kick out of that creative aspect of it. But I like just the basic, you find a property in an up and coming area. Yeah. Yeah. You, you put, you stick some renters in there. You don't have to do anything fancy because um, I I I I, don't, I personally stick around like the C B class properties um, just because um, you know that way if uh, if, if I, I well sorry I would buy them uh, C class B properties in markets that are right on the out, outskirts of, of A markets um, that you know are renting for just these insane uh, monthly rents you know like twelve hundred bucks for a, a one bedroom per month and you know eventually this, those people are going to want to start you know, moving somewhere where they could, you know, it's more affordable. And that's kind of what, I, what I'm seeing in, 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 my, in my rentals right now. So, you know, location wise, I like to pick um, places that are right next to really a nice areas. And, you know, since we're talking about barrier to entry and kind of transitioning to, you know, expertise and experience, that does take some experience, right? Because, you know, every neighborhood's different, every street's different in a, in a neighborhood. And so if you're, you know, if, you, if someone tells you to invest in, in Cincinnati, for example, like that, I mean, there's a market in Cincinnati where houses are you know, over a million dollars or where you can get, as I said, rents for $2,000 for a two bedroom unit. But then literally a mile over, there's fourplexes that rent for $450. And so you have to, um, it, it does take a lot of, um, not necessarily, uh, it's just a, a time consuming activity to, to understand your market, but that's, but you're gonna have that for, uh, for everyone. Uh, uh, so, something, something else about kind of the barrier to entry is, as I just said, was um, experience. So, for, so for me, you know, I <laughs> maybe I'm an anomaly, but you know, the second I learned about uh, long-term rentals, I just went and bought one the next day. And I would, the reason I was able to do that was because I was able to um, do the house hacking situation. So I was able to, you know, put down 3.5 percent. Um, in hindsight, I wish I would have done the 203k type of loan because I did renovations to it. I just didn't again. I didn't know 
anything. And so I didn't, I paid out of pocket for the renovations. Um, but I was able to get in there and get a, a crazy return just because your, you know, your, your, your down payment is, is so low. And so in regards to barrier of entry, from, from my perspective, um, I think long-term rentals are, are great because of the, uh, the, the, the opportunity to do the, the house hacking um, strategy, which is you, know, you, you buy with the owner-occupied loan, you live in one unit, and then you rent out the other ones. Um, it has to be a, a residential property, um, of course, but you know, that, that way you could live for, li essentially live for free. And so it's a great strategy for people that are just out of college that have you know, maybe 10 grand saved up. Um, I actually started with, what was my down payment? I think my down payment was like 5,500 bucks. And I ended up renting uh, the top one for, for $1,400. And my mortgage was, I can't remember exactly what my mortgage was, but I was actually making money. And I was like, this is the craziest thing ever. <laughs> I just can't believe this is, is real. And of course it's different for me because again, I didn't know anything about real estate. And so when I was, I, I thought that you had to be like, have like a, some sort of certification to invest in real estate. I was, I was like, I was a complete noob. Um, and, and, and also again, and then as, as, as one other point um, is about, I want to ask about uh, the team. So I'm not necessarily sure if you are doing all the management your, yourself, but um, if you, if you aren't, or for people that have, you know, a full-time job and, and, and they can't, um, they don't have the time to, to manage it um, themselves. Uh, how do they kind of, kind of go about, about doing that? Is that, is that a challenge that, that you or your, any of your, your clients have? Well, um, that's interesting that you should say that because um, so in the beginning, I was all about creating systems and streamlining. So I implemented all these systems in my own house so that I didn't have to do as much. Mm -hmm. You know, I trained cleaners and put in systems for inventory supply. And then at one point, I outsourced the communication to a co-host. So that pretty much took everything off my plate. It was that yeah. simple. And then actually, um, I did have people that had properties asking me to help them. So I started a guest management services business so that I could do all those things for busy landlords and help them enjoy the income without the hassles. So, you know, if you're scheduling cleaners and restocking supplies and that's a hassle, then I was taking care of that for them. So um, since then, I've been teaching people now how to start guest management services as well because the need and the demand is so huge across the country and the world that there is enough to go around. Um, I have to say, though, I love your story about the house hacking. Um, I wasn't sure what that term meant, but I love that oh. you shared because it's crazy. My daughter right now, she's buying the house she's living in because it happens to be a duplex. Um, it's like a pocket listing deal, right? The, the tenants mm -hmm. in the back moved out. The landlord came to her and said, I'm thinking about selling it. Do you want to buy it? She said, sure. And she's already got a storage unit full of furniture. So the minute she closes escrow, she's throwing all that furniture in there in the back house and turning it into an Airbnb. So it's there kind you of your strategy, but now it's on steroids. So now you've got yeah. the extra income from the short term rentals to just amp it up. So yeah, she's been doing Airbnb too um, in her own house, and now that she's got this opportunity, she already understands the power of Airbnb. So it's not even a question, long term or short term. She's going short term all the way. I think I found a, a title of a book for you. It's called instead of house hack, it's the Airbnb hack. <laughs> I, I think that that's going to be the the next big thing because we, we were house hacking before. House hacking was a thing. I think Brand, I'm not sure when Brandon Turner coined that term, or if he's the one that even coined that term. But uh, the, the guys that taught me about real estate, they both house hacked. You know, five years before I was house hacking, so back in the mid mid two thousands, but um, it wasn't called house hacking. I don't even know how he uh, dis discovered it. I, I I actually have no clue how he discovered it, but I'm glad that he 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 told me about it. Uh, That's so, a brilliant strategy. So so you you kind of you kind of we're already touching on it. So we'll we'll transition into the uh, the next factor, which is um, time commitment, because obviously we want to make money, but we also you know time is also a very valuable resource. And, and of course, for, for any strategy, you can automate the entire process and really have no time in there. But for, um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say my side first, because I kind of did all, all three entry level models. Uh, so for house hacking, um, and again, this is just m me personally based off my personality. Uh, that one was the most stressful for me. Um, and so obviously when I'm stressed out, that affects you know, my time because I'm not productive at all. 
but it was just stressful. Um, and it could be due in part to not knowing what I was doing um, before I, I entered. But you know, whenever I was, whenever I just thought of the house, I, I thought it was going to fall, you know, fall, to, you know, fall to the ground, catch on fire. Um, <laughs> I, always, I was, when my phone rang, I thought it was a tenant telling me something was wrong. <laughs> so I was, I was, I was a mess, which is kind of attributes to why I didn't. Um, I, I took like a two-year break. Uh, but then after those two years, when I bought these twelve units. I was I, I did that, the management of all of those uh, myself, and I mean it, it. It wasn't. I probably, if I would say, I probably spent on av- on average maybe around ten hours a week uh, doing that full time management. Uh, once, obviously, I first took it over and got all those you know, large duties out of the way, which is you know, setting out all the new letters and letting everyone know who you are, um, fixing you know any ongoing uh, deferred maintenance. Um, which was, you know, people that are listening to this know all about that. <laughs> my, my, my boiler issue. I'm probably known as the boiler guy now. Um, and, but I mean, once I was done with that, you know, I, I was actually doing them. I was, I was doing, I mean, most of my time I spent doing landscaping. Like I'd go there and rake leaves and mow the lawn. Um, and so obviously that's stuff that's very easily automated. And, um, and it is only 12 units, but um, the, the time commitment on that end wasn't very hard. And now that I have an actual property management company, it, it's even less because whenever something happens, instead of me you know, having the tenant call me, I have to you know, go there and, and look at it and see what's going on and then find the proper you know, person to, 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 solve the, uh, to solve the problem for them. And now the property management company will either do all of that up front, if it's a small maintenance issue, to do all of it, and I won't even know about it until the end of the month. Or if it's larger, he'll just say, "Hey Theo, here's what's going on. Uh, here's what I've already done. Uh, you know, here's the here's the quotes. Uh, we can do this, this, or this. You know, option A, B, C. Uh, what do you want to do?" And then I just, you know, bing, bing, bing. Look at my 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 uh, phone. I go, option A, <laughs> and then that's it. Uh, so um, that's how it is from from just I guess my specific situation. Again, I know that it's, it's it's different if you don't have if you find the wrong property management company, that could be a problem if you. You know, if you have a bad maintenance person, that could that could be an issue. Uh, but those are kind of just the three different, uh, I guess, I guess really two different types of of, um, of strategies for long term rentals that I did, and the time commitments associated with each. And so my question for you, because this is you know what I what I would imagine is that it would take it'd be a, take a lot of time to to manage uh, a a short term rental because of all the kind of the extra variables. That are are involved that aren't involved for for long term, but I'm sure you have a perfect solution for for that. So let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, no. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I have to admit, you know, when you own property, you still have those same issues, right? If you're a landlord, you still have to make sure that you know deferred maintenance is kept up, and you know things can go wrong, and you have to fix them. Um, the benefits, though, uh, what I've heard from my landlords that when I've been um, managing the properties for them as a guest management services manager, so it's similar to a property manager, um, but it eliminates a lot of the headaches for landlords, I'm going to say, in three major areas. Okay. So first of all, when you are a landlord and you're looking for a new tenant, the time it takes because you want to make sure you get a good tenant, you know, this is going to be a long-term thing and you want to go through the process of screening and running their credit and their background check and their bank statements. And then you, it's like courting them, you know, Mm -hmm. and you have to meet them and then you interview them and you show them the property and that that time process, I don't even know how many weeks that takes for, I mean, if you have a property management company, they're going to do that for you. But that process of finding a good tenant, um, takes a long time. When it comes to short-term rentals, everything boils down to three questions. And in my system, it's actually three questions that when they answer my question, I can give them an answer whether they're going to stay or not in less than a minute. So we've re- just reduced the whole screening process <laughs> down to like 30 seconds. And, and what are the three questions you ask? Uh, I ask them, where are you coming from? Who are you traveling with? And what will you be doing while you're in town? <laughs> but you have no idea. They seem rather innocuous, but those are some extremely <laughs> loaded questions. <laughs> and it's very important that you answer correctly or that's it. You know, I'm not staying. So um, 
but it's interesting because I worked backwards from all my horrible experiences with bad guests. I started saying, well, if I had done this, I wouldn't have had that problem. And as I started to see patterns, I started to be able to eliminate uh, the things that were going to cause problems. And it just boiled down to those three questions. Yeah. So um, when it comes to screening, now we don't have to pay a management company to run credit and do all that and show the property and put signs and post ads. None of that. Airbnb handles it all. Um, and then I just have to screen three, three questions, boom, and that's done. I guess, I guess so, kind of, just a, a quick follow-up question on that before we move on to the other two. Like what, just, what would be an example of something that would like eliminate someone from, from contention? Um, okay, so when I'm asking the question, um, who will you be traveling with? It's very carefully worded because when the answer comes back, oh, I'm not traveling with anybody. I'm booking on behalf of my mom and my sister who are going to be visiting me while they're in town, but I don't have a room for them to stay in. That falls under the category of a third party booking. And that's a rather extensive explanation of why you don't want to do that. Okay. But immediately in the wording, when they answer me, if they are booking for someone else, that's a decline. And I've got horror stories to explain why, but we won't go on into all that right now. It just suffice it to learn from experience. <laughs> That's one way to weed out a lot of problems. <laughs> okay. So, um, what was number two? Uh, not, not, not the question, but you said the, the second thing to reduce uh, the time commitment. Right. So, okay, um, the repairs and all that good stuff, right? And you said if you have a good management company. Um, one of my, my landlords he had a property in Whittier, five bedroom, three bath, and it was super high end. He was getting 4,500 a month for it, renting it to like the Dean of Whittier College or something like that. <laughs> and the tenant moved out uh, and he had his management company find him a new tenant. So the management company did and it was a disaster. You know, it was kids and they started bringing their friends over. They turned it into some sort of a den of iniquity. I don't know, but it went downhill fast. and. Um, then they had to evict everybody and when they got in there after the eviction process he discovered this massive hole in the ceiling that was caused by some sort of a leak and he said hey management company you were supposed to be checking on this at least every six months how did that get there because it had been like two years and so things like that don't happen when you're doing short-term rentals because you have such high turnover any little thing is boom, taken care of done it doesn't come you know blow up into a huge huge okay. problem so you save a lot of money on that end. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that is interesting, I don't know if it's true in other states, but in California, when you rent to somebody or lease, the tenants have more rights to the property than you do. And it's kind of annoying. You know, if you want to go in and check your property, you got to make an appointment. And if the tenants don't want to let you in, that's it. You can't go in. And it's weird because it's your property, yeah. <laughs> you know? I never understood that. Wait a minute, who's making the mortgage payments here? But that's the law. So when it comes to Airbnb, you can come and go in your own property whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, like one of my landlords, he's calling me saying, can you book, the, uh, you know, open it up, but block this weekend because my wife wants to have a book party with her girlfriends, you know? And you say, sure, it's your property. You could do whatever you want with it, you yeah. know? And, it's a huge benefit for landlords to have that control over their own property. It seems like such a small thing, but you know, wow. <laughs> yeah, 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 control, yeah, control is, uh, is, is definitely big. And, and as, as, you, as you said, you know, in, 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 in California, I'm sure it's a statewide, you know, tenant, tenant friendly state versus landlord friendly state. And so with a, with a quick Google search, just for people listening, you can, you can see, I can't remember, I've looked to do it before and, and I can't remember on the top of my head uh, which states are are the best for for landlords? But yeah, it's things like how much time do you need to give them before you can go into the property? Um, you know, can you just show up, or is it twenty four hours notice? Um, and then kind of the the, evic the eviction the eviction process, the security deposit return process, uh, those all vary. And so, kind of, I, 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 I mean, maybe maybe that will you know convince some people to invest you know in an out of state market opposed to their own market. But you know, again, like most things we're talking about, uh, it. It all depends. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's so. I guess the the the, the last two two kind of categories aren't um won't take too long to talk about. One of them was uh they kind of already mentioned this the extra variables involved uh from with short term rentals over um long term rentals. 
um, things like, you know, furnishing the units. Um, that's something that, that uh, I, I didn't think about until I was researching, but um, is the importance of, of reviews. Uh, are, are reviews very important for, for short-term, I guess reviews being important for, for short-term rentals as opposed to someone like me who's got these four, you know, four units and doesn't have, have a company because, um, and again, I, I, well, I guess it would be that the reviews on, on the Airbnb, not like a Google review, but you know, so you have to, since you're you know, kind of under a microscope, you have to you know, be on, on top of your game a little bit, whereas for me, I don't, I'm not saying I'm slacking off or anything, but you know, it's just a, a whole different thing. Um, uh, other examples are, and I guess you can get creative with this, but like the, like the amenities, like are you like what all are you going to offer? Are you just going to do just the standard toiletries? Are you going to put some some goodies in the fridge for them, or leave them a bottle of wine to you know, you know make them really enjoy their stay? And then um, and then so I, I know Bombardier bombarding a lot, but then also if you are going to do a, a, a have a property management company, um, I know for for long term rentals, uh, you know you're looking around ten you know, percent. I guess this is just generalization, but ten percent of the collected in, income for a single family, and then as you get to you know, between four units, you're looking at maybe eight like percent, um, and and I don't know what the the short term rate would be, the short term rental rate would be, but I do remember at the the best ever conference, um, someone who does corporate housing was was a uh, short term corporate housing was there and said that it was like twenty five percent property management fee, and I was like, I, I obviously I understand that it's all relative based off of the the, the income you're bringing in, so you're bringing in five times as much income, but you're only paying three times more in, in expenses and it's fine. But um, I just do, do you want to kind of kind of speak on anything I just said there? <laughs> <laughs> I know it was a lot. Ah, overwhelm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I actually wanted to go back to the previous conversation um, and say that evictions are another issue. If you don't have, uh, if you, if your state is not um, landlord friendly, you know, um, if you do short term rentals under 30 days, usually, 30 days is the limit that if you cross over now, you're in long-term rental territory, you have to evict tenants if they don't comply. But if okay. you're under 30 days, boom, now it's just a matter of trespassing and it's so much easier to deal with. None of the mm -hmm. headaches. That's huge. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Got that off my chest. Now um, <laughs> onward to the other good stuff that you were talking about. Um, so when it comes to reviews, you know what? That's so incredible because, um, when we started doing, before Airbnb, we were, uh, hosted international students in our house and all of our family and friends would say, you're crazy. How do you let strangers stay in your house? But reviews are what changed the game because now there's a certain amount of accountability and it keeps everybody on their best behavior. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because that's built into the system, if you get bad reviews, you don't get to use the the you're not part of the community anymore, right? Yeah. People will. So it's it's actually what's created that trust that allows people to be crazy and stay in strangers' houses. What are you doing, right? I say the same thing about Uber. You know, when you're a kid, didn't your parents say, "Don't get in the car with a stranger"? <laughs> you know, what are we doing now? We're hopping in cars with strangers like nothing. Why? What changed? Reviews. So that accountability and that being able to see that other people had a good experience before you. So it's probably okay, you know, it gives you the confidence to go ahead and, and yeah. enjoy the, the use of that. So yeah, reviews are huge. Um, and it's funny because when my daughter was looking for an apartment, she had a website that she checked and there were apartment buildings with reviews for the long-term tenants. So I do know, yeah, you are getting, you know, reviewed on Yelp or something. Like yeah, that. It, it, it's usually, again, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's usually for, like, for larger ones. Like uh, you know, because if you're looking at fourplex, I mean, maybe you could put like your, you know, your your rental company, like your whatever your LLC or your rental company is on there. If you have like a website that all of your rentals, like a portal for all of your rentals, and tenants can come there and, and, and see your see your rentals on the website, then you know, once you Google that website, there'll be that little thing in the in the side on Google where you can do Google reviews. But um, I I think it's based off of uh, having a a a website. So if you have a website for your company. Then you're most likely going to have the the reviews. And mm -hmm. again, when you are doing anything in your life, uh, whether you're trying to find a restaurant or a place to live or a place to go on vacation, you know, everyone just Google's. You know, I want you know, the best restaurants in Tampa, Florida, and you know they'll just sort based off of the number of stars and the number of reviews. And so it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. You know, it's kind of the point right now where reviews are, as you said, they're a game changer. But now it's like one of the it's so important to have have solid reviews. And so. I just, I'm glad that you, uh, so do you have like a, I guess some sort of strategy or, you know, a couple of other things that I was talking about? Is there certain amenities that you, that you have 
Um, are there certain, you know, I guess, you know, techniques or anything that you do to make sure that you're always getting that perfect um, five-star review or 10 stars? I'm not sure what the, the rankings are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's the way we live today. Everything's being reviewed. It's just part of our culture now. Um, so yeah, it's actually pretty cool. On Airbnb, they give you the playbook. And they say, if you want to be a super host and can, you know maintain a star rating, this is what you got to do. You go. So you're like, great, that's it. All I got to do is that. So you know, it it revolves around six different areas for a host. Um, I don't think I can name them all off the top of my head, but uh, the most important ones are accuracy in your listing. So whatever you're promising, you better deliver, right? That's common sense. Um, it's setting expectations basically with the mm -hmm. guests. Um, Cleanliness. Cleanliness is so important yeah. because it's the first impression. I mean, I've had a guest come into the bedroom and you know, like dramatically tear down the, the sheets off the bed and go, ah, oh, it's clean. <laughs> what was that? Did they expect like a rat under there or something? I know, right? You know, okay. So they're really wanting that cleanliness, you know, and you're like, okay, good. Um, there's a lot of ways to ensure cleanliness. I have something called the quick change over cleaning system that I developed so that we get consistent results every time because it is critical to keeping your super host status and getting five star reviews. Um, communication is the other one um, that can be the biggest deal breaker and make it so hard for guests, especially when they're coming from other countries or they speak other languages. But Airbnb gives you all the tools so that you can over communicate. You can use pictures, you know, so that it's very clear and it makes yeah. everything so smooth. Um, there's a lot of different things. Um, location though is the one that has just driven me nuts. And I think other hosts too, because that's one of the things you get reviewed on and we're like, what can we do about the location? It's all like, oh, I can't move the house, you know, <laughs> which I could, but yeah. So, I'm sure they do that just for, so people that are, that are like, selecting where to live or selecting where to go if they want some amazing you know view or something then they'll they'll look at that and be like that's like their main deciding factor but yeah there's nothing you can do about that <laughs> right and, and we're aware that we're not you know at the beach with a view of the ocean okay we're 26 miles away so our re our price reflects that you know we're not 300 dollars a night we're 49 dollars a night so we make up for it yeah work with me here yeah so <laughs> but um yeah, and, uh, yeah. so, so um I guess that, that hits that. So the, so the last category I was going to talk about was, was competition, but I, I think you've, you've hit on that because again, uh, you can, you, so, you know, for, for obviously for long-term rentals, um, there's you know, plenty of, in, uh, there's, there's plenty of actual properties that you could buy. I'm not saying that there's you no, know, they're, they're being sold or the owners are willing to sell, but I mean, there's gonna be thousands and thousands of, of, of single families and two duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes that you can choose from um, in, in your market. And then for obviously for, for short term rentals, you know, going into this conversation, again, I thought that it wasn't something that you could do everywhere. But you know, you as you explain, as long as you're super creative, you can Airbnb out a piece of dirt. So that kind of, <laughs> that kind of answers that question. Uh, something else I wanted to talk about too, just kind of uh, just to wrap up here, um, because this has been a, a very um, insightful conversation. Um, from, a, from a more personally, me and uh, I just moved to Tampa. And, you know, we go to the beaches all the time now and it's still just a, 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 amazing. I'm, I still go and I'm like, I can't believe I, I live here. <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, used, I'm used to living in uh, Cincinnati. So like when we got here in January, it's, it was snowing there and then we come to sunny beaches. But um, there's you know, uh, so many cute little beach towns uh, down here that, I, I know, you, you, can, you can see that there's obviously vacation rentals down there. And, um, and so, you know, we, we've considered buying a, a single family house. Uh, not necessarily on the beach, but uh, in one of those beach towns, and then you know furnishing it, and then when we're not there, Airbnb it. But then it's something where, well, what if we just Airbnb it during the week, and then on the weekends we just literally live like down there. It's like after work we just drive down there. And I know we max. I know we make more money renting on the weekends. I'm assuming, but but still, um, I mean, again, everybody said it depends how creative you get. Um, but that's something that you know I we were considering doing to so coming in this conversation. I was thinking in the back of my head the entire time. It's like we could we could totally do this. We could have a, we could have a beach house, but make money if we're having a beach house. Um, and then, but, but but so there's that. But then I know there's one thing that you wanted to um, or that I wanted to hear from you, which is your um, what did, what did you call it? You called it the ultimate leverage strategy. Um, so do you um, want to just hit on uh, what your ultimate leverage strategy is? 
Okay, sure. Oh, and by the way, you know, all, more power to you because if you decide to go with that beach property, you've got the best of both worlds, you know? You could stay in it when you want and go back to your other house when you don't want or, exactly. you know, rent it on the weekends or once a year or whatever. You've got all the options open to you. So I want to see what happens with that. Keep me, up, keep me posted. <laughs> But um, yeah, so the ultimate leverage strategy came about because I teach people how to make a six-figure income with Airbnb, you know, renting rooms and spaces in their own house. They can make $1,000 to $10,000 a month, um, showing landlords how to trade their long-term tenants for short-term guests, eliminate eviction headaches, and double or triple their rental income on their empty rentals. Mm -hmm. But then people kept saying, well, what if I don't have a property? Uh, what if I don't have enough startup capital to furnish a place and I said oh well there's an answer to that you can actually get in on the Airbnb game and you can start an Airbnb business that you get paid for to start so you know when people want to start a business and they start asking like well you know how much is it gonna take you know and if you're looking at buying a property well three percent or you know do I have to go out and get a loan two hundred fifty thousand or maybe it's zero to start no this business model the ultimate leverage you actually get paid to start your business anywhere from five hundred to twenty five hundred dollars per listing per I mean per property so hmm. it's a pretty powerful strategy and it's providing um, guest management services to busy property owners and landlords. Okay. So it's, um, in contrast, I guess the, the newest model I've been hearing about lately is, oh, let's use other people's property. But when they say that, they're actually going out and renting a property mm -hmm. or sub, and yeah, and then subletting it on Airbnb, which I've actually been approached by landlords, pretty smart landlords, and they're like, hey, why don't you just give me a flat fee per month and you keep whatever else you make on top of that, which I do, so that works too. But the way you can get in on this without having to have that monthly payment or pay the utilities or have to worry about any expenses, zero costs out of pocket, is just partner with those busy landlords and property owners by providing the guest management services. So if anybody out there is an Airbnb host right now, you're, you're like, little light bulbs are going off like crazy. So, and if you don't already have experience doing that, I have a course called the b, &B Freedom Formula that teaches you how to become that Airbnb expert so that you can start to offer those services and create a six-figure income from your own Airbnb business. And the beauty of it, because there's, no cost to you is it's unlimited in the scalability so you can grow this as big as you want and I teach you how to um, outsource all of the different pieces of it so that it doesn't depend on you and I give you the pieces to fill in as your inventory grows so that you can you have unlimited capacity so it's a very exciting business model and it's been blowing it out of the water because so many people haven't been able to get in on the Airbnb game until now. So okay. thank you for letting me share that. Oh, that, that, that's awesome. So, I mean, as, from, from my understanding, so it's, it's essentially you're like an Airbnb kind of property manager. Like you're, you're, you're acting as, a, as the property manager, management company for people like, you know, example for, for you, if you didn't want to um, do anything, not anything, but if you didn't want to do uh, the day-to-day -day activities, you know, from, from my perspective as a, as a, as a, as a long-term um, landlord, I'd be like, oh, I need to find a, a regular property management company. Whereas if I was an Airbnb host and I was you know, sick and tired of dealing with you know, cleaning toilets, as they always say, um, you you get this, um, you get this, uh, was it, get, you say Airbnb guest services, what you called it? Uh, guest management services. Guest management mm -hmm. services. Okay. That's a business model that I've developed. Um, it's not endorsed by Airbnb or anything, oh, okay. you know, um, but I use Airbnb as the tool to deliver my services. So um, I've been training people how to provide those services as well so that they can actually tap into that additional income and get paid. Um, actually, oh, you were asking about what the, you know, how much you make, right? Yeah. So with the Airbnb management, it's more uh, 20 to 50% because you're right, we increase the income so much that it's still a smaller slice than it would have been at 10% on a long-term rental. So yeah, yeah so, it's a very so, so, so if you're a property management company, you should be if you you know are either interested in starting a property management company, um, this is something you should definitely uh, be interested in and, and pursue further because I mean if you're making 
20 to 50 percent on a revenue that's five to ten times higher than what it would be otherwise then you're gonna be able to scale a lot faster yeah absolutely and i just need to make sure that people understand you know um if you are a property management company already this is a beautiful tie-in why not just start offering this additional service save yourself a lot of time on screening and all that stuff you can probably reduce your uh your number of employees and save some money yeah. on your overhead who knows but um in order to do the guest management services it's not technically property management so you don't need to have all the licenses and permits and everything involved because um yeah because of the way i set it up you're not handling any of those things technically so that you are free to just go out and start your business without any restrictions awesome well, i think we should i think we should uh, end the, 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 the debate portion uh, with that uh, powerful strategy. And uh, before we wrap up, I just want to just uh, quickly look, uh, 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 I asked you some um, uh, of the listener questions. And uh, we, had, we had a question earlier from, from Whitney, and so we really appreciate that. Uh, we, we had a second question from, from Grant, and it's something we talked about way at the beginning of the conversation. Um, so I apologize for that, Grant. But um, he asked, what happens to an existing Airbnb property when a town or city um, outlaws uh, Airbnb. Do you have to shut down existing Airbnbs or can you just not create a new one? Ah, oh, good question. That's a good question. Yeah, so it's happened to folks. They've been in the zone where it's not just like they've changed the laws and said now you have to get a permit or now you have to comply, but they've actually said, nope, it's banned. So unfortunately, you do have to stop doing Airbnb short-term rentals. But short-term rentals, again, mean anything under 30-day rentals. So a landlord, if you own that property, you've got so many options open to you, right? I mean, that's the nature of real estate. We're always looking for higher and better uses for it, and there's a ton of them. Yeah. So, you know, you have all the options open to you. You know, you can go back to long-term rentals, or even there's an in-between, um, Something that's really fun is corporate rentals. Mm -hmm. So business travelers, sometimes they need to stay for two to three months. Uh, traveling nurses, you know, people who need a short stay but longer than 30 days, you could still do that, no problem. And you will be compliant with the no Airbnb, which is actually any, nothing less than 30 days is what they need. So you still have a lot of options open to you. Makes sense. All right, Sue, so I, I really appreciate it. Just to kind of quickly summarize uh, what we talked about. And so we were doing Airbnb slash uh, uh, short-term rentals versus long-term rentals. And we were kind of comparing them across a variety of different factors. In regards to returns for short-term rentals, you're looking at approximately three times <laughs> as much rental income um, from, as uh, compared to, to uh, long-term rentals. Uh, the only potential drawback is the, uh, the fluctuations. Um, but again, you know, with a little creativity, you can, you can fix that. Whereas, you know, for the long-term rentals, you're not getting as high of return, but you do have that, that consistency. Um, in regards to barrier of entry, uh, which is much a surprise to me, um, you can do these um, anywhere. Uh, you can do it in um, a city, depending on you know, the rules and regulations. Uh, you can do it in the suburbs, uh, which as you said, it was one of, the, one of the main places you can do it. And then again, my favorite part of this conversation is the, the dirt. You can really Airbnb dirt so people can ride around on their dirt bikes. Um, and then for, obviously for, for, for long-term rentals, uh, you, can, you can do them anywhere as, as, as well. Um, we talked about the, the time commitment, and you gave us a couple of strategies, um, but three things in particular that you can, can, um, can do to, I guess, kind of reduce the, the time commitment. And I went over a couple of, of uh, kind of stories of my progression through you know, managing you know, my own pro the property I lived in to managing properties I didn't live in to finally uh, ridding myself of that responsibility and uh, giving it to um, a... A, a property management company is doing a great job. Um, then we kind of hit on a competition a little bit. Uh, then we wrapped up with the, the ultimate uh, leverage strategy, which is essentially a, pr a property management for Airbnb, but with uh, insanely uh, much higher <laughs> um, returns. Uh, so, I, I think, so I really appreciate you being here. Everyone who's listening, thanks for, for tuning in. Um, uh, where is a, uh, a good place people can, can learn more about you, learn more about the information you've talked about today and learn more about kind of your, your short-term rental strategies? Uh, they can find me at sueoyuela.com. Uh, we might want to put that in the show notes because it's kind of hard to spell, but hey, my name's right there <laughs> on the screen. So if you can spell it, sueoyuela.com, um, that's a great place to learn more. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you again. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. I hope you guys enjoyed the, uh, the first ever, uh, best ever debate. 
And uh, we will talk to you guys soon. Awesome.